So what we're going to talk about today is really why intermittent fasting and low carbohydrate diets work, whereas the calorie counters, it just doesn't seem to work, right? And the problem with the calorie theory is that it's just like wrong. And because we don't really understand obesity, that's why we can't cure it, right? So I'm sure many of you have seen this show. It's called The Biggest Loser. And it's on North America, it's in Australia, it's everywhere, right? And what people do is they're contestants that compete to lose weight. And they get put on a diet. It's a calorie-reduced diet. And they do, do a lot of exercise. And you've seen Jillian Michaels screaming at everybody, right? So it's a lot of exercise. And they don't show it on the show, but there's actually a fairly severe caloric restriction as well. It's not a low-carbohydrate diet. It's more of a kind of everything in moderation sort of an approach. So the problem, of course, is that this show has been running for a long time. And certain of the contestants have come out and said, well, you know, this really doesn't work. Now, the reason more haven't come out is because they're essentially under a legal gag order, right? They're actually not allowed to say any of this stuff. But certain contestants have actually come out. And so this contestant, Suzanne, said, well, they never do a reunion show. Why? They've all gained that weight again. And it's not. It's not unique to The Biggest Loser. A lot of diets, and we've all done these calorie-reduced diets, it does the same for everything. It does fine for about six months, but then after that, it just keeps coming back. Your weight plateaus, then it starts to come back. And everybody knows this, right? Because everybody's done this diet. The question is why, right? And that's what we really have to understand. And that's what I mean by we have to solve the two-compartment problem. And I'll explain that in a second. So the Biggest Loser diet, despite the fact that we all know it doesn't work, is actually ranked very highly. So USA News, for example, just this past year, put the Biggest Loser diet at uh, number three for weight loss and number 11 overall. So really a very good diet. And why not? It's a eat less, move more sort of approach, right? Cut your calories in, increase your calories out, and hey, presto, you're going to lose weight. So that's why it does so well, because all the doctors recommend it and so on. The thing is that there have been some studies that have been done on these contestants. And it's very interesting to look scientifically at what actually happens to these people as they do this sort of eat less, move more approach. Now, the biggest loser, of course, is that approach on steroids, right? So you're eating a lot less, and you're moving a lot more. And that's why you get these dramatic weight losses. So one season, they actually took these contestants, made them sign consents, and then actually did metabolic studies on them. And what's interesting is that at first, it looks amazing, right? And we've all seen that show, right? The before and the after it looks amazing. And the studies really bear that out. So if you look at the before and after, if you look at the uh, composition of weight loss, so at week 6 and week 30, at the end of the uh, show is week 30, you can see that they've lost a lot of weight, right? This is 60 kilograms, right? And this is fat mass. So most of it is fat, right? Everybody says, oh, you're going to lose muscle, you're going to lose muscle. No, they're losing mostly fat. There's a little bit of muscle loss, but it's mostly fat. And this is their body fat percentage. And you can see it follows a pretty steady trend downwards. And the average went from 329 pounds to 202 pounds. So an amazing result, right? Body fat went from 49% to 28%. So at the end of the show, you get these great results. You have the end of the show. Everybody wins. And they pretend like everything's fine. But we know that it isn't. And why not? What's the problem? It sounds like it should work, right? You keep doing what you're doing, and you'll keep losing weight. But you don't. And the reason, and we've known this for at least 100 years, is that your metabolism starts to slow down. And this is what happened to the metabolism of all these contestants. And you can see in the um, solid bar, that's their baseline rate of metabolism before they started this. 
and the open circles is that afterwards. You can see that in virtually every case, these people are cutting the amount of calories they expend by a lot. Okay, so you can look at some of these dramatic examples. So this fellow, for example, is, starts out by burning 3,500 calories a day, and he's dropped all the way to about 1,700 calories a day, right? And it's not just him, it's everybody. If you take the entire group of people, the average decrease in metabolism is over 700 calories a day, right? So if you start by burning 3,500, which is a lot, say you start at 2,000, you're gonna drop down to like 12, 1,300 by the end of the show. So you wonder why you're not losing weight. Well, it's because your metabolism has slowed down so much that if you're burning 1,300 and you are eating 1,500, remember that's still a lot less than you used to eat, you're gonna gain the weight back. That's exactly what we all know happens. You feel cold, you feel tired, you feel hungry, you feel like shit. And the weight is going back up, right? And that's the problem, right? We all know that's the problem. It's the decrease in metabolism. So you can try to make up for it with more exercise, right? And that's what they pretend that you can do. So you can see at baseline, there's a certain amount which is resting metabolic rate, certain amount of exercise. During the show, they burn a hell of a lot of calories as exercise. You see that they've ramped up, so your total energy expenditure is better. But when you stop exercising for like, you know, five hours a day, then your exercise goes down. But look at what's happened to your basal metabolism. This is your resting metabolic rate. It's already gone down by week six, okay? So don't kid yourself. This is happening all the time. But by week 30, it's gone down even more. And that's the whole problem. You get this metabolic slowdown. And because you're not burning as much energy, you don't have that, you know, liveliness. You don't feel very good. And you can see this um, in this graph. You can see this is the biggest loser contestants. And you see that the basal metabolic rate just keeps on going down. But there's a similar extreme measure that doesn't seem to have this problem. And the question is why? So you can look at bariatric surgery. So bariatric surgery is stomach stapling surgery, right? So you cut your stomach into the size of a walnut. You really just can't eat. And you can't eat for months and months and months. And guess what? The weight goes down, right? That's not a surprise. The surprise is that it works to keep weight off in the long term. Yeah, there are a lot of problems with this, OK? So uh, let's be clear. I'm not recommending it for anybody, right? But if you look at the resting metabolic rate with a similarly sort of extreme measure, it goes back up. The question is why? So this is another uh, study of the long-term effects of bariatrics. And you can see that at baseline and at follow-up, this is several years later, the resting metabolic rate and the total energy expenditure, how much energy you're burning, has really not gone down. Right? As opposed to the eat less, move more, where it's, it keeps going down, keeps going down until you fail. Right? That, of course, is the saddest part of all. Right? The saddest part of the entire thing is that we know about this metabolic slowdown. This was shown in 1915. So we've known about it for 100 years. What I think is sad is that we give people this really horrific advice to eat less and move more. And then when they fail, we blame them for it. Right? And that's basically you're blaming the victim. Because here's this poor fellow or poor lady who's victimized because they're suffering from obesity, from type 2 diabetes. You give them really bad advice, which you know is going to fail, because we've all done it. It fails every single time. And then when the weight goes back, you say, yeah, you should have listened to me better. You should have had more willpower. You shouldn't have eaten that bagel, or whatever it is you tell people, right? And that's really the saddest part of all, is that we try to pretend that the advice that we give is really good, and the failure lies with all of you, right? That doesn't, doesn't make any sense, right? How can like 40, 50% of the population 
be so morally bankrupt that they let this happen to them? Is it not more logical that the advice that we gave was just really crappy? That seems to me much more sensible. So we're going to explain why this sort of discrepancy exists. So in order to do that, you have to understand what happens when you eat. Okay? So what happens when you eat is that insulin goes up. So most foods, almost all foods, have um, a mixture of macronutrients, fats, carbohydrates, and protein. So your insulin goes up to a varying degree. And insulin basically is the hormone that tells your body to store fat. So it stops your body from burning fat. You start to store some of the sugar and store some of the fat. Okay? And this is normal. This is a normal situation. So carbohydrates get turned into glycogen, which are chains of glucose. So chains of glucose in the liver is basically a storage form of sugar. Okay? And when you have too much of that, then your liver produces lipids, which is called de novo lipogenesis, and it basically stores fat. Okay? So when you don't eat, when you're fasting, so fasting is merely the absence of eating, your insulin levels fall. And that's a signal to start pulling some of that energy out. Right? So you're going to start by pulling some energy out from the glycogen, which is your stored sugar, and you're going to pour some, pull some energy out of the stored fat. So you can think of it, the glycogen, like a refrigerator, right? You're storing food energy. And the reason it's like a refrigerator is that it's easy to access. So you can get put food in easily. You can take food out easily, right? It's just food energy. And the fat is more like your freezer, OK? So you can store more of it, but it's in your basement. You know, it's hard to get to. It's hard to get out. It's hard to put in. So you generally prefer to use your refrigerator. And it's the same idea. You have two storage forms of energy. One easy to use and one not so easy to use. The refrigerator, though, has a limited capacity. So if you, put, if you have too much stuff, you have no choice but to put it in your freezer. Now, the reason that the calories don't work is that they operate on what I call a one compartment model. Okay? So that means they pretend that all your calories goes in to your body. And it's all the same. All your calories are the same. They're stored in one giant compartment, like this sink. And when it comes to taking out energy, it all comes out of the same thing. Right? Therefore, if you follow this sort of very simplistic, incorrect model, what you see is that if you simply reduce the calories going in, you'll reduce your weight. And if you increase the calories out, you'll increase the rate. But the entire premise of this sort of calories in, calories out model is completely fictitious. Because we know that's not what happens in the body. The body doesn't have some giant vat of calories, right? You can store sugar, you can store fat. It's not some giant vat of calories that's held somewhere in your liver, right? But that's what they all pretend it is. So if you have the entire wrong idea of why this should work, then it's not going to work. What instead is a better model is a two-compartment model. That is, there are two places in the body where you can store food. You've got your fridge, and you've got your freezer. Your calories goes in into your fridge, and your calories goes out from the fridge, because that's the easiest place it goes. But there's a third thing that you have to consider, and that is how much food goes back and forth between the freezer and the fridge, because that's what we're really interested in. This, the fat, that's the one that's much harder to get to. right? And the question is, what's controlling this? Because that's really the key. And it turns out that the main player is insulin. We know this because insulin inhibits lipolysis. Right? What that means is it stops you from getting the fat coming out. That's its job. That's its normal job. So if you have a lot of insulin, right? so normally if you eat a huge meal, your insulin is high, it's going to tell the body to move all the, the storage in this way. If your insulin is very high, then you can't get the food back out this way. And that's the problem. So if you have a lot of insulin resistance, for example, which keeps your insulin levels very high, 
it's like that freezer is kind of locked away in the basement behind a locked you know, steel bar. You can't get at it. So what happens now when you start reducing your calories? If you start reducing your calories in and you can't get at your storage, what your body is simply going to do is reduce the calories out. That's what it does, right? Because it's not going to keep losing weight until you die. That's just ridiculous, right? Those in person study. They reduce calories by 350 odd per day for like seven years. And they estimated that people would lose 30 pounds. Women would lose 30 pounds per year, right? So in seven years, they should have lost 210 pounds, right? <laughs> of course, that didn't happen. How much did they lose? Not even a single pound. It was ridiculous because what happened, of course, is that their body, if you're not affecting the insulin, you can't get at that fat. You're just going to reduce your calories out. And notice here, of course, that we're not breaking any laws of thermodynamics, right? Calories in, calories out. Yeah, you're accounting for all the calories. But what's important is the compartmentalization of energy, right? That's what we're talking about. Not the total energy, but where it goes, right? Because that's what we want to know. If you eat and you just burn it off, who cares? That'd be great. But if you eat and all of it goes into fat, well, now you care a lot, right? But it's not that calories are in balance. If you eat an extra 500 calories, your body burns it all off as fat, uh, burns it all off as heat, yeah, who cares? You don't have any extra body fat. But if you eat 500 extra calories, boom, the insulin is telling it all to shunt into here, well, that's a problem. And that's really the problem of the two compartment syndrome. So if you look at what happens during fasting, what happens, because everybody worries about this, right? Oh, what about protein? You're burning your muscle, right? So this is a study by Kevin Hall um, from the NIH. And he basically looked what happens during fasting. And this is what happens, right? So for the first couple of days of fasting, what you see is that carbohydrate oxidation goes up. It goes way up, right? In other words, you're burning sugar. You can see that fat doesn't actually move for a couple of days. You're not burning a hell of a lot of fat, right? And then as you run out of the glycogen, remember that the glycogen is your easily accessed energy, but limited in terms of how much you can store. Once it all burns out, then look fat oxidation goes up. Now you're burning fat for energy. That's perfect. That's exactly what we want to do. But what happens to protein? Are you burning muscle? Hell no. It goes up slightly, OK, at the very beginning, then drops. So protein is not a storage form of energy. Why would your body burn it for energy, right? You hear this argument all the time. You're going to burn muscle, right? So it's ridiculous, right? Because you're telling me that the way we're designed is to store energy as fat, but when the chips are down, we'll burn muscle, right? OK, like, I don't think so, right? It's like if you have a wood-burning stove, you store firewood, right? Because you're going to burn it. But when the chips are down, you don't go chop up your sofa and throw it into the fire, right? It's crazy. The other thing that's ridiculous is that if you have repeated fast famine cycles, like cavemen might have had, for instance, so you store fat, burn, burn muscle, right? So at the end of a few of these cycles, you're like one giant ball of 100% fat, right? It's like that's what happens to the bears, right? It's like, come on, don't be ridiculous. You don't burn muscle. Protein, yes, you do need a certain amount of protein to maintain your lean protein, right? But it's not increased. That's my point. It's not that it's not it's zero. There is some, right? But it's not increased in response to fasting. So the reason that I talk about fasting and low carbohydrate diets is that what it does very effectively, and probably more effectively than any other intervention, is it empties out that fridge, right? And remember, what you want to do is get rid of all that insulin too, right? Because now, if you don't have insulin telling your body to shunt all that energy into fat, now you can start to move your calories out this way. 
right? If you have a lot of insulin, so we do this, for example, with if we give people exogenous insulin, they can't lose weight, right? Even if they fast, it's very hard because they can't access that fat. They just keep reducing their calorie uh, expenditure. But the whole point is that fasting provides the easiest way. You get rid of all that glycogen, you get your insulin down so you can actually access your body fat, and there. And the whole thing is that, why can't you fast, right? You know, I asked my son one time, a few years ago, you know, how do you lose weight? And he goes, he was six or seven at the time, and he goes, just don't eat. So easy, right? It's like, huh. <laughs> How can you be so right about this <laughs> point that has escaped like 99% of the world's doctors and dietitians, right? If you don't eat, you're going to lose weight. And here's the thing to understand. There's nothing wrong with it. That's the way we're built, right? That's the way lions are built. That's the way tigers are built. That's the way bears are built. That's the way we're built. We're built to withstand these repeated episodes where there's no food, right? Because back in the caveman days, there's no McDonald's, there's no refrigerator, there's nothing. There, there are times you're going to have nothing. That's why you have fat, right? That's the whole point. So one of the most ironic things is that this is what you hear all the time. Fasting is going to put you into starvation mode, right? Uh, this is actually very ironic. <laughs> Because starvation mode refers to the idea that your metabolism slows to such an extent that you're going to regain weight. Okay, So I've heard that before somewhere, right? <laughs> That's exactly what happens when you try to reduce your calories. right? If you don't do anything about your insulin and just reduce your calories, your metabolism goes down. You're going into starvation mode. But what happens during fasting? Does it happen? Well, here's a study of four consecutive days of fasting, right? So this is in normal people, right? And what you see is that at the top, the weight goes down, right? So that's great. That's exactly what we expect to see. But what happens to your REE? This is this middle line here. That's the resting energy expenditure, right? That's your basal metabolism. It doesn't go down. It goes up. Right? You're burning more energy than you did. Now, you might think, why is that so? Well, it makes a lot of sense. Because suppose, again, you're a caveman. And there's nothing to eat. It's winter. There's nothing to eat. Right? So if your body starts shutting down, then you're even less likely to find something to eat. Because you're tired. You can't go out there and hunt a woolly mammoth. You're tired. Right? You need to sleep. So that's gonna, you're all going to die like that. Right? So your body is just not that stupid. Right? Your body says, wow, you have nothing to eat. So I'm going to give you energy. I'm going to increase the amount of energy you're burning. And I'm going to provide it from your fat stores. Because you need to go out and eat and fill up this refrigerator again. Right? So that's exactly what you'd do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Right? It'd be like cockroaches and insects running the world. So what happens to your VO2, right? That's how much oxygen you can metabolize, right? Does it slow down? No. It goes up, right? Again, you have more capacity to do exercise, more energy. And why is that so? One, you're burning fat for energy, and your body's like, ooh, there's a lot of this, right? So there's plenty of it. Let's go. But the other thing you see is that the norepinephrine, so norepinephrine and epinephrine are called adrenaline or noradrenaline. So your body is actually providing you with a big kick in the pants to keep your energy expenditure high because that's what you need to do to survive. So insulin drops, which is one of the major things that we want to see. And your hormones, that's a hormonal, remember obesity is a hormonal disease. It goes up. It's providing you the tools to burn fat. So there's no starvation mode. Actually, it's quite the opposite. It goes up. You can do something called alternate daily fasting, which is kind of one day of fasting, one off. And in these studies, it's not actually a full fast. So they still allow about 500 calories on those fasting days. So it's not even a true fast. But the calories are low enough that you still get the benefits. And if, again, 
If you look at the resting metabolic rate, which is the first line, you can see that from baseline to day 22, so you know, a couple of weeks of alternate daily fasting, your resting metabolic rate really hasn't dropped. Your um, fat oxidation goes way up, right? So you're burning fat. You can't argue with that, right? You can measure these things. You're burning fat. Why? Because you have no carbohydrate to burn, right? Because you're clearing out that fridge, you're clearing out all that stored sugar and burning fat. That's great. That's exactly what we want to do. The other thing we talked a little bit about already is that you're going to burn muscle, right? And again, the idea is that you're, you're, you're going to burn protein to provide glucose, right? And this doesn't actually happen. And this has been known, again, for 20, 25 years. So if you look at urea, urea is this big line here. So it's a breakdown product of protein. So you can see that you excrete a certain amount of um, nitrogen every day. You're also taking in a certain amount of nitrogen every day, right? This is under normal conditions. Now you fast people, like you just give them nothing to eat. Well, what happens? Well, there's virtually no urea coming out, right? Now there's nothing going in too, but what you, you notice is that you're not burning muscle. Because if you're burning muscle, that urea should skyrocket, or at least be as high as this. So your body is actively conserving your protein, your muscle mass, right? And that's what happens during fasting. And you can do 70 days of alternate daily fasting, right? So 70 days is more than two and a bit months. And what you see is that the, if you measure fat mass and fat-free mass in this study, you can see that fat mass goes down very nicely from 43.5 to 38.1 kilos. And the fat-free mass, your lean mass, doesn't move at all. So these are sort of some of the myths that everybody tells you, right? Starvation mode, burning protein. And here's my favorite, right? It doesn't work. That's never going to work, right? It's like, OK, genius. If you don't eat, do you think you will lose weight, right? Well, yes, you will, <laughs> right? So it's not exactly a very good comeback for people to say it won't work because it will definitely work, okay? It will definitely work. I'm not saying it's easy, okay? That's a whole other thing. Can you do it? That's a separate question. I actually think that most people can do it. But if you are able to do it, yes, you will lose weight, right? And here's the thing. So back in the uh, 1960s, they have done a bunch of studies on these patients. And what they did was they admitted them to the hospital. They did that back then. And they just watched them. And you can see that people lose weight. And here's the thing that I always say as people are, goes, oh, how about women? Women shouldn't fast. I'm like, why not? Don't you think you'll lose weight? Yes, you will. Now, if you're underweight, then yeah, you shouldn't be fasting, right? You're going to get amenorrhea, you're going to get menstrual problems. But if you need to lose weight, yes, you will lose weight. And that's exactly what they found in all these studies. So you have men, they lose weight. Women, they lose weight, right? And what you can see that it's fairly steady. There's no kind of drop off, right? There's no drop off, that kind of dreaded weight plateau. Because that's the whole problem with weight regain is that we all plateau. And there's so many advantages to fasting that are just not available, in that it's completely different from most um, other diets, which tell you what to do. Because this is really the opposite. It's something you don't do, right? So one of the biggest advantages is really that it's completely sim simple. You can explain it in like two seconds. And everybody understands intrinsically what it is, right? Now, there are variations, right? There's fat fast, there's juice fast, there's you know, water only fast, there's no water fast. There's all kinds of variations. But at its very core, it's easy to understand. And that's important because if people don't understand what you're trying to do, they can't do it, right? Um, it's free. Like, you know, as much as I would love to always eat home-cooked meals and, you know, long-simmered bone broth. The truth is that most of us sometimes don't have the time and don't have the inclination, don't have the money. If you want to eat grass-fed beef every day, it's going to cost you. If you want to eat organic all the time, it's going to cost you. I'm not saying that 
Uh, you shouldn't, but it's expensive. And some people just have no money. So I have people who write me from the Philippines and they're like, you know, I got all this stuff and I can't afford anything. It's like, well, there is no cost. There's no cost at all. It's convenient, right? So again, you can cook all you want, but it takes time, right? It takes time. And sometimes you just don't have the time. But this one, there's no shopping, there's no preparation, there's no cooking, there's no cleanup, there's no eating, right? There's nothing. It's so convenient. Because again, the key is it's not something to do. It's something to not do, right? And that makes it completely different than something that you can add, something that's completely flexible, right? So it's not like, oh, yeah, you need to eat six times a day, right? It's like sometimes you just don't want to eat six times a day. Sometimes you're busy, right? Well, this is going to give you more time. You can put it in anywhere. You can do it tomorrow, and you can not do it the whole next week, and then do it again, right? You can do whatever you want. It's completely flexible. You can do it for 12 hours. You could do it for 12 days, right? It doesn't matter. And really, the, the, the point is that you can add it to any diet because, again, it's something that you can put in and fit in wherever you need to, right? So say you want to eat the, you know, the, the rice diet or something like that. You could still fast, right? That's the whole point. You don't eat meat, you can still fast, right? You don't eat wheat, you can still fast. You have a nut allergy, you can still fast, right? You don't have time, right? Hey, you can still fast. Uh, you don't have money, you can still fast. You're traveling all day, you can still fast, right? You don't cook, yeah. You can still fast, right? And probably the most important thing is that it really has unlimited power, right? And as a doctor, Sometimes you get into these things where you, you, you want to do something and it's not strong enough, right? Well, you can just keep fasting until you get the results you see. As I said, if you don't eat, you will lose weight, right? You're almost, it's almost impossible to not, right? Can you keep it up? That's a separate question, right? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that, I mean, you do have to have the proper medical supervision, especially if you're on medication and so on. But you could fast. You could fast. I have a 75-year-old who did like 30 days, right? He felt great, right? The world record is 382 days. You can keep going, right? And this is the whole point, is that this gives you options because it's not a diet. It's no diet. It's nothing, right? It's like Costanza. It's a show about nothing, right? There's a talk about nothing, right? <laughs> George Costanza, so smart. Uh, <laughs> that's the whole point, is that because it's the opposite, it gives you so much flexibility. And it has the ability to really free ourselves of the chains that bind us down, right? We have all these problems, right? The number one problem in the world today, right? You got heart attacks, you got cancer, you got strokes, you got diabetes. You got kidney disease, and it's all due to obesity. It's all due to diabetes. But yet, we have the ability to free ourselves from all of these modern afflictions, right? Only with the application of a technique they knew 5,000 years ago. The ancient Greeks were all about fasting. Not for health. They didn't have a lot of obesity back then. But because it gave you energy, it gave you like mental focus, right? That's why they did it. And these involuntary periods of fasting eventually got taken out, right? The, as we um, started getting more reliable food, then religion started introducing periods of fasting, right? So if you look at any major religion in the world, they have periods of fasting. They have periods of feasting too, but it's balanced by periods of fasting, right? And remember that they're not trying to kill all their practitioners, right? They're not like, oh, you should fast, ah, you'll die, ha ha. That's not it at all, right? They did it because there is something deeply intrinsically beneficial to the fasting, right? And it was always known, always, 
It's a cleanse, it's a detox, right? There's probably only one thing that the three most influential people in the history of the world agreed on, right? So the prophet Muhammad, Jesus Christ, and Buddha. They all agreed on one thing, and that is fasting is very beneficial. It's uniquely beneficial, not only for the spirit, but also for your body. We need to clean ourselves out of this junk that accumulates, right? All this excess of sugar, all the insulin, all the fat. We need to clean it out once in a while, right? It's a spring cleaning. That's all it is. And yet, with the application of this kind of ancient time-tested technique, we can break free of all this. Right? You know, in the last century, we, we, we broke free of a lot of infectious diseases, right? Tuberculosis, pneumonia, and all this. And now all that replaced with was all these diseases. But we have the knowledge. We only have to apply it. And that's the most ironic part of all. We won't. But there's no reason why we won't. We've always been told by everybody that we have to do this. And yet, why do we not? My son knew it. Any questions? I have a couple of minutes left. Uh, we're going to take them at the end. Hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs>